of Faith in a Base podcast 007, Working on Works. Works. That's a funny sounding word when you say it out loud. Works. <laughs> this little word can have a variety of meanings. A computer works, meaning it operates. A municipality has public works, the infrastructure built to support the smooth operation of that community. A person works, meaning they put forth labor to produce something and hopefully get paid. A religious person might perform good works or good deeds, meaning they are performing a religious activity or action for the purpose of pleasing God. When it comes to the age-old debate about God's requirement that man must be baptized to be saved, it is often to this word, works, the argument turns. The anti-baptism folks say, man cannot be saved by works. And you know what? I can't argue with that statement. They are correct. The Bible teaches man cannot be saved by his good works. So surprisingly, both the anti-baptism folks and the folks who believe that baptism is indeed necessary for salvation agree on this point. We cannot be saved by works. So what's the problem? The problem is we're not defining the meaning of the word works. What is a work? If we're using the word work to refer to a good deed someone does in order to gain favor with God, that's a completely different word use than if we say we are working for God based on what God asks or commands us to do. Let me give you an example. Is prayer a work? We might say to a friend, I've really been working in prayer for you. And that's a fair use of the word work in context of prayer. And I've heard that statement used many times. Jesus told us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We don't consider his instructions to mean that we are to perform some kind of good deed called prayer. We would never call prayer a work because we are humbly doing what the Lord asked us to do. This activity called prayer is a response to Jesus' request that we pray. Now, here's another example. When Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper and said, do this in remembrance of me, is this a work we perform? No, of course not. Communion is a religious activity we do because we eagerly want to do what the Lord has asked us to do. We perform this activity because we love Jesus. Activity being another word for work. Prayer, or the Lord's Supper, are religious activities Christians all over the world perform on a regular basis. Yet, no Christian would consider these things to be works, right? We understand them as an appropriate response to a request the Lord made. And, as a good Christian, we are happy to humbly comply. Now, I can't imagine any real argument about this concept. When the Lord gives a command, that command is to be obeyed. But, something very curious happens when it comes to the Lord's command to be baptized. Suddenly, we define baptism as a work of human merit or, or a work of the flesh and conclude one does not need to be baptized because it is a work and we're not saved by works. In the case of prayer and the Lord's Supper, we understand Jesus' requests are something to which we respond. But when it comes to his command to be baptized, we completely reject the command by labeling it as some kind of performance ritual. Deeming baptism a work creates a straw man argument. The straw man argument is created by labeling a thing with an incorrect meaning, then attacking the falsehood as if it were true. In this case, we label baptism as a work of man, even though it's a command of Christ, then argue our point based on that false premise. Now, using this logic works perfectly in order to skillfully and carefully arrive 
at a wrong conclusion. Since this logic is so pervasive in the modern church, let's take a look at the scriptures used to support the view that baptism is a work. A good place to begin might be in Romans, and in fact, this is probably the go-to scripture the anti-baptism folks use. Let's read it. It's Romans chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Then, a little bit later in Romans, Paul continues this thought in Romans 4, 13 through 16. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He's the father of us all. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the faith example of Abraham, who received a credit of righteousness, but not because of his good works. He believed God, and by grace and faith, he received God's blessings. The Bible says that righteousness comes by faith, not by works. Again, there's no argument about this. Considering these passages of Scripture, I think we can be fairly certain that human works are of little value in the salvation process. Let's look at another passage. Later, Paul continues this same theme. Romans 9, verse 30 through 32. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith? But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Here, Paul contrasts faith and works. One leads to salvation, and the other to stumbling over the very person in whom we should have faith, Jesus Christ. So, again, we have no argument. Works are of no value for our salvation. This is probably enough for now, but I'll stipulate there are other passages of Scripture which tell us that works of merit are of no use in the pursuit of salvation. But we're working on works here, so let's define our terms. Now, don't forget... We are examining an erroneous argument here, and with a little poking, things start to fall apart. What are these works the Apostle Paul is talking about here in Romans? The works Paul is talking about are the performance-based rituals established by the Old Covenant. He's talking about very specific activities Jews were required to perform, such as the sacrifice of the Passover lamb or the keeping of the Sabbath. These rituals and activities like them kept the Jews in a right relationship with God. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we should be able to see a pretty clear distinction between these Old Testament works, which were acquired by law, and the man-made works of merit we've been talking about. Paul's not talking about good deeds somebody made up, which would prove their loyalty to God in an effort to win his favor. While it is true people will attempt to do things for God in order to win his approval, these are not even remotely the things Paul's talking about. He is exclusively identifying Old Testament activities. So this is why using these passages as arguments against merit-based works for salvation is not valid. The New Testament establishes that we are no longer required to do these things, and if we're depending on them, we're not acting with faith in Christ. So, it is a bit curious that when the argument is presented labeling water baptism as a work, it's to these types of scriptures we often turn. These scriptures have nothing to do with baptism. However, if we have built a good straw man, we can pull together a fine-sounding but erroneous argument. Now, the topic of water baptism brings us to the New Covenant. So, let's return to our earlier examples of the Lord's Supper and Prayer. These are activities the Lord asks his followers to do. Are these activities something man made up? No. Who invented them? God did. 
These two activities are commands or requests Jesus made. But why do we do them? Is it out of a legalistic, hard-coded duty to the Lord? Nah, no way. We do these things because we love the Lord and want to do what he has asked us to do. This then becomes a matter of the heart instead of a legalistic obedience to a command. We do them because of relationship, not rules. Prayer and communion are not the only activities Jesus told us to do as part of our relationship with him. He also told us to be baptized in water. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. It seems to me we need to humbly ask, did Jesus command us to do this, just as he told us to pray and share in the Lord's Supper? Yeah, it is commanded by Jesus in the Great Commission. Now, here's where things may get a little bit confusing. Please listen carefully. Many churches actually practice full immersion baptism in obedience to Jesus' command. But there's a problem. Again, please listen carefully. Who did Jesus tell us to evangelize, teach, and baptize? Lost people or saved people? Well, Jesus told us to reach people who are lost, people who are still in their sins. He did not tell us to evangelize and baptize anybody who has already been saved. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and see what Peter said. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who was baptized by Peter? Well, people who were responding to the gospel. These are people who are still in their sins and did not yet have the Holy Spirit. Right here, we see three things happen. A command, a correct response, and a corresponding result. Look at Jesus' instruction in Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. In this passage, we see only people who believe and are baptized will be saved. Now, there's a clear progression from obedience to a result, isn't there? Salvation comes after belief, right? We can't argue with that. But salvation also comes after baptism. How do we know this? Because in this passage, there is a coordinated conjunction linking belief and baptism. Whoever believes and is baptized. These two things can't be separated. Only people who meet both conditions are saved. So, this is the problem. The modern evangelical church baptizes for a different reason than what we find in the Bible. They baptize people who believe they are already saved and their sins have already been forgiven. Now, theologians call this a believer's baptism. They've even invented a little phrase which helps their congregations understand the concept. It says, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. They've been taught that baptism is just a sign of something that has already occurred inwardly, and baptism is a follow-up activity. Do you see the difference? If I'm not teaching people the right way to respond to the gospel, do you think God will accept that? Is that the true gospel? Can I invent my own way to be saved? I don't think so. I think God has provided a clear, reasonable, and easy-to-follow instruction, and we just need to follow it. Now, let's make this a little more personal. Let's do a little exercise. I want you to think about your own conversion. Think about the first time you made your decision to become a Christian. Let me help you identify that time in your life. I want you to ask yourself, how did I get saved? How and when were my sins forgiven? That is, after all, what saved means. What was my specific response to the gospel message and when did I do it? What did I do to inherit eternal life? Now, don't get hung up on that word do. It does not mean that you worked for your salvation. Listen, you had to have done something in order to be saved. You had to give your heart to Christ in prayer, or you might have gone forward in a church service, or perhaps you raised your hand when the preacher asked you to respond. Maybe it was just a quiet little decision you made in your heart. The point is, you had to take some action, even a very small one, before you or anyone else would have considered you saved. Now, there's a very fine line dividing the lost from the saved, and nobody is in both realms at the same time. Everybody who has ever been saved had to do something in order to respond to the gospel. If we don't have to do something in order to be saved, then all people everywhere are saved, and that just doesn't work, does it? We hear conversion stories where a person was in a church service or listening to a gospel message on the radio, 
and an inexplainable feeling of power and compulsion came over their heart, and they had no choice but to surrender to the will of that power they believed to be the Holy Spirit. For many of my friends, this is when they believed they were saved. They felt something and responded to that feeling. Once again, this is a very identifiable, specific point in time, and their activity is simply to surrender. Many believers point back to an amazing experience like this as the time they were saved. So, what step did you take in order to respond to the gospel message and become a Christian? When and where were you when that event happened? Now, you have a specific point in time in your mind which you believe is the instant you moved from an unsaved state to a saved state. Even if it was just a decision you made, you did something. Okay, now think carefully. Was that point in time before or after your water baptism? If that salvation experience was sometime before your water baptism, the bad news is that you have not obeyed the gospel correctly. The good news is you still can. Baptism is not an outward sign of anything. Baptism is not a work of man. Baptism is the only biblically prescribed response to the gospel message. The biblical plan of salvation does not call us to say a prayer, accept Christ, or surrender our heart to be saved, and then at some point later get baptized in obedience to Christ. The biblical plan of salvation, according to Peter, is simply and immediately repent and be baptized. Folks, baptism is not something man made up. It's not something that someone pulled out of thin air in the first century, which sort of caught on and became a nice tradition of the early church. It's not a man-made activity. If we love Christ, we humbly obey his commands. Why would we argue with him about this? Let's not call Jesus' commands human works. If we do that, why don't we say belief in Jesus is a work of man? Using consistent logic makes belief just as much a work as baptism. Belief is a work? Yeah, even Jesus says that. Listen, John 6, 29. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Wow, did you ever hear that before? Jesus calls belief in him a work. That's wild. Belief is a work. I think this passage is very interesting, though, and may help us clear up an important nuance missing from our grand argument. Did you notice that special phrase in Jesus' comment? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. This passage does indeed identify believing as a work, but it categorizes it as a work of God, not a work of man. It's the same with water baptism. Baptism is not a work of man. It is a work of God. Man did not invent it, but man must submit to it. That's what we do with commands of Christ. The very nature of a command implies obedience, right? When commands come, action follows. There's some very specific thing we must do in order to respond correctly to the command. And while we're at it, did you know that belief is actually a command as well? Not just a work. That's right. Belief in Christ is a command which must be obeyed. Consider this passage from 1 John 3, 23. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. If you think about it, everyone who claims all we need to do is believe in Christ to be saved is actually talking about doing something. They're calling us to obey this command. I think that's pretty interesting. So why is baptism vilified and labeled with such a ghastly epithet as work? Why? Because it is a necessary part of the conversion process. Listen carefully. Can you think of anyone who wants to make it difficult for you to become a Christian? Who in the world wants to prevent people from being baptized? If baptism has nothing to do with conversion, who cares one whit if you were baptized or even had a modicum of urgency about it? Who wants to confuse people regarding the meaning of baptism? Who wants to hide and obfuscate the fact that Jesus commanded us to be baptized? This sounds an awful lot like Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Did God really say? Why would this even be an issue if it were not something very, very important? Don't you see? Someone's really trying hard to keep us from obeying the gospel. He'll tell us 
It doesn't matter. He'll tell us, you were baptized as a baby. He'll tell us, you don't need to obey Christ the correct way. He'll tell us, you don't need to go through such a silly, humiliating ritual. He'll tell us, this is all just a bunch of doctrinal hair splitting. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what's in your heart, and you know you're a good person. But then again, he really doesn't need to say all those things. All he needs to do is to convince us that baptism is a work of man instead of a command of Christ. You know, a humble heart is eager to obey Jesus' command to be baptized immediately upon accepting the gospel. Now, if you're just coming into a correct understanding about this issue, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Just think about it. If this wasn't an absolutely critical issue, why would there be any argument about it at all? We have Jesus' inarguable command to be baptized, so why not just have a humble faith that obeys? Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org slash blog.